Tom Curry, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me. Um, you, I've heard you say before, with injuries, you're currently injured, you've had a, a fairly intense surgery, but I've heard you talk before about when you're injured that you obsess over something else. What are you currently obsessing about? Oh, this is really real, actually. Um, so obviously, when we were speaking before, I, I am pretty mobile still, but I obviously can't do the things I'd like to be doing, especially for the next four weeks while I'm kind of partial weight bearing on crutches. So for me, the first thing is I looked down at my hip and it looked like I had like a BBL. And my right hip was just huge. <laughs> um, so kind of the big challenge for me was, was getting that inflammation down. Um, obviously there's a science that you want a bit of inflammation because you know it's your body's natural reaction and it's got stuff that helps heal the hip and everything but for me it was getting the swelling down and that was kind of the way I eat with how many like and how much anti-inflammatory food you have Um, and for me it's been cutting out uh, cutting out sugar through kind of carbohydrates um, cutting out sugar obviously through sweets and chocolate and stuff not that I was a big I wasn't I was never really like a big confectionery person anyway um but especially kind of the last week and a half it's been how many fruit how much fruit and veg can i eat how um how many antioxidants sort of thing can i, can I have <laughs> so supplements wise like morning lunch evening just having as, as as much as i can with like turmeric beetroots obviously collagen calcium um your fish oils just getting just smashing that basically so it's been uh, diet diet's been the thing that you've yeah, you've, you've obsessed yeah. over matcha tea as well um just wow. a lot of, it's been quite good like just researching different bits um gonna cbd soon thing is this is the thing as well this is also kind of the journey of the injury and probably what put me in, in this injury in the first place is not is i don't really do things half-heartedly um and i get quite obsessional about things so um, yeah, it's about kind of balancing that, I guess, but it doesn't sound like I've done that so far now, I say it out loud. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I did that with a couple of injuries that I had. I mean, once you, I, I heard you talk about, again, if you have a lower body injury, then you, you might go and do upper body weights and things like that. But yeah. if you're if you're not able to train as much, I, I, I did that. I mean, when I, I, first injury I ever got when I was like 16 was a, um, was a, a stress fracture in my back. So I was like, right, fracture my back. Now, this is what, 2006. So the the amount of information that was out there in the world around um, around supplements and stuff like that and what good diets and things like that were, were wasn't massive, but yeah. I smashed like calcium tablets. <laughs> it was like, I was like, <laughs> right. Is that because of the bone and the yeah. fracture? And stuff? <laughs> yeah. I was like, right, if I get, if I get cal- more and more calcium in, then I do it. But I think I got to the point where I, I created like calcium stones and like that was not great. And and it was, yeah, it was a bit obsessive and yeah. then just, this just overdid it. But, um, did it work out in the end? Well, I mean, my fractures, my fracture here, unfortunately my <laughs> career ended through a fracture, but like it was, it, it healed and I, I came back all right. So that was the thing. So was, is there a, is there a food that you have added into your diet that you're like, Oh, this one might actually this one might actually stay. Um, not yet. It's, it's still pretty early doors. Um, I'll see. I, I, I need. I, I need to see because with with everything, like it's all about kind of finding out for yourself. I think there's so much research, and this is just in general. This isn't just kind of the food stuff we're talking about. There's in in and everything. And if if you have a view, you can always find information that supports that view. Yeah. Um, so for me, I just I, I, I need to find out really. Yeah, so that, like, D- diets. You go into the world of diets. Like everyone will just tell you what they want you to hear, or they that yeah. they, they, like the carnivore diet could be the thing that just yeah. <laughs> just completely yeah. is the right thing to do. And you, if you go down yeah. that road, like you, yeah, there's it's very tough. I, I find diet with I haven't had a nutritionist on the podcast. It's something I probably will look yeah. at doing. But again, it's it's interesting to know if the nutritionist or any nutritionist has a certain type of of method that they view as beneficial, and 
they're doing that, they're pushing that because it's maybe something that they've used or maybe it's something that they found really beneficial for themselves personally. Whereas actually I, I found, and again, you'll probably know this better than anyone, that everyone's so different in how they manage different foods and you get better responses from it. And when you're in a sports team, like you need to have a pretty wide range diet just for many different things. But again, with rugby, such an interesting one because you guys are yuling uh, a lot and you're putting a lot of calories in. I was at a, yeah. one of the Premier League uh, Premiership clubs like a few months ago and just was there for breakfast and I was I mean I was just I had pan my plate over for breakfast and it's like four eggs bang minimum and then it's like yeah. bacon it's like an entire pig thrown on your plate you're like oh, okay yeah. right <laughs> it's just yeah, it's it's insane but but knowing what the right foods to eat as an athlete is I think it's really complicated at the moment there's so much information like you said 100% and especially when there's loads of different cultures like you go to the South, you go to the South Africans and they'll be like just just eat red meat. Just eat yes. red meat. Yeah, built um, on. <laughs> yeah, it's like, exactly. So it's kind of, th there is loads, but I think the most important thing, and um, this is kind of what I learned after the first few days of doing this, is, is definitely balance. Um, just eat everything. Kind of like I said, I want to stay off pasta, stay off pastas and pizzas, basically, because that's kind of what was keeping my weight on, really. So it's basically pasta and pizza, which is unfortunate. Um, although I did have a naan bread two days ago. But it's my dad's birthday, so it was all right. Well, you can, yeah. There you go. Pizza would be if I had to get rid of pizza, that would be the that would really be the end of me. Like yeah. pizza, pizza, yeah. That for me is is it's just it's, it's it's the best food in the world. Yeah. Well, it's even for like rugby, like you don't realize kind of how much you do it until you stop, and then you I've lost kind of five five kilograms. Now, probably since since the scan when i found out i was going to be having surgery to to this point which doesn't sound like a lot but that is to me kind of i've shriveled up and, and kind of weaned away sort of thing yeah no it's uh, it's interesting so just for people that do or do not know what what is the surgery you've actually had done so what was the injury that you've had to had to overcome here so there's a few bits in, in the hip, basically the the hip is, I don't know, I'm pretty, it's, it's arthritic, he's got arthritic kind of growths on it, on like the, the femur neck um, or the head. So, and then it's got lab, lab, the, it's got tears in the labrum and then the cartilage is torn as well. So kind of, you, you hope you wouldn't have that as a 25 year old. So basically they've gone in and they've just done a hip arthroscopy. There are a few options, but we've chosen the hip arthroscopy, uh, which is basically keyhole surgery where they go in and he's shaved the ball into kind of, he's shaved the head into a, a, a circular ball. Um, then he's, he's sewn up the, the tears in the labrum and kind of that was meant, to, that was meant to be a two hour surgery. Um, there, but it's um, it's ended up taking six hours because I think the bone was so hard, probably from the calcium. Um, the bone was was pretty tough to get through apparently, and then he also got some synthetic cartilage because he wasn't. I don't think they were planning on doing the cartilage, but he got some synthetic cartilage and put that in, and he's drilled into the bone, got the bone marrow, and then basically like a little salt bay, he's like put the the bone marrow on top, so the stem cells were kind of. To, well, hopefully they'll catch on and, and take over and, and heal the cartilage. Wow. So it's, it's honestly, I woke up in all sorts of bother, but I know that I couldn't like feel my foot because my foot was elevated and strapped up onto this thing for six hours. Um, so yeah, it all makes sense now. So yeah, it's a pretty big up, but um, yeah, he, he spent a lot of time in there. Like you said, you're mobile, you're moving around, they want you to do that. Do they give you sort of an indication of the the timeline of, of, of how, how something like this goes? Or because they've done some extra stuff in there, does that make it a bit more complicated or does it actually make it a little bit better? Um, well, it definitely makes it better long term. I just Short term, it's, it's, it's different because we're already a week behind because I wasn't able to go on. I say a week behind. After these surgeries, you're meant to go on a bike the day after. I only went on a bike yesterday. So we're basically exactly a week behind already. Um, I'm partial weight bearing on crutches for four weeks. I think that was meant to be like one or two weeks. 
Um, so it changes a few bits. It's more, it's very slow early on. I think kind of coming kind of return to play is pretty similar. And um, we can't really tell right now, to be honest, um, as or when that'll be. I think the most important thing is just kind of listening to it and, and making sure it's right. Kind of the, sur the surgeon was just saying the, the biggest success right now is after four weeks, if there's, uh, if it's a quiet hip, there's, there's no pain, it's not niggling. And that's, that's success right now for me. Yeah, you seem pretty relaxed about it. Like you, is is this something that you've kind of taken an, an approach you've taken with injuries just because of having them before and sort of you running a playlist in your mind of right, we're going through this this again. Oh no, this 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 one's been very different. I've had a long time to kind of get my head around this one because I, as I, I tore my hammy three times in a row at the start of the year. Luckily, I made the final, but I missed kind of the whole Six Nations. Came back, then was in England camp and um, tore my ankle. But luckily, kind of, I thought my whole World Cup was over for a few hours. So that was that was all right. But this one kind of was, you know, I was on the um, a Zoom to the surgeon, and kind of after every option, he 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 mentioned retirement. Oh, um, wow. That was pretty, pretty dark. And I think for me, like that was, I've had like three or four weeks to get my head around that. Um, and now the surgery is actually done and you can start doing stuff about that. It's, it's a lot more refreshing, I think. Yeah. Wow. That is in that, that's intense. If they're actually openly talking about that. I mean, yeah, I've been, I've, I've been in those conversations before and I know they, they weren't, they're weird conversations. Like they almost when they say that I, me I remember when it happened for me what age it, were you i was 26 and i yeah. ended up retiring i, I ended up yeah. retiring but it, I, I remember leaving the surgery and after they told me that because mine was a case of this is not a case of if you're going to get this injury again it's a case of, of when what was it sorry so i had a vertebrae that was fracturing over and over again and it was stress fractures on stress fractures on stress fractures and it was this oh, one oh no. Yeah, it was this one specific part on an un, not not necessarily an uncommon side, but usually you would get a bowler that would fracture their vertebrae on the side they collapse when they bowl. So yeah. if I'm a left armer, I would it, I collapse to my right, and it would be yeah. my right side. And I've had that before. That was the one I had when I was 16. But then okay. when I was 25 and 26, uh, it, it started refracturing on the left side, which where it had. Um, you can see on the scan it had essentially a, a, a bone growth so where the bone is fractured and then healed it's come back yeah. stronger and then it healed it, it it fractured worse through that that side and he was like look we could i mean he started talking about putting pins through it and fusions and and i was like this is i i i'm quite fortunate that i was having a bit of a long-term lens on it and my my journey into the sport in general is is unique and and i was like look I've, I've got six years out of this sport six more than i probably ever would have wished for and i don't want to be 60 and not able to pick up my kids or or grandkids or whatever it is and yeah and um for me that i remember that conversation of just sitting there with the surgeon and telling you like we don't think this is if this is when and we advise you to re retire and not consider playing this sport at this level and I remember just being in a bit of a daze. I was just a bit of like, yeah. did that just happen? Did he just say those words? I remember leaving, like calling my parents and being, he said these words. And I'm like, did, and I actually don't think it really sunk in for weeks. I don't think it, and then essentially, obviously, the actually having to do it. And I think at the time I was a, was a bit of like egotistical bravado going on where I was like, well, this is just what I'm doing. And you're kind of going through the motions like, yeah, I'm retiring and, but the actual emotional impact didn't, it was definitely delayed. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I think for me, it was pretty immediate. I think, and then I was lucky I had my girlfriend with me and she, she was very good to me. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I think you always think like it doesn't, it's it's kind of like it'll just go away sort of thing. Like you, I, for me, I didn't believe him. The first time he told me, I didn't believe him. Then he told me a second time when he laid out the three options of no surgery, surgery to this level, and then and then the surgery where you'd have a hip resurfacing. Uh, 
so, so yeah, it was it was a pretty unbelievable few weeks. I think that's why I'm able to like be as, be a, quite a lot of peace now because everything's been done for it. And I've spoken to a few guys to be honest. I don't know if you did, but uh, this is another conversation. But kind of in rugby, you, you do your ACL. There's thousands of people you've done that done their ACL. You do you know you rank thousands in just in the sport. You do this. And I've managed to speak to three or four people about this surgery. So it's kind of there's there's no there's no numbers in in the game. Um, so, but but they were brilliant to be fair. Especially kind of Sean O'Brien. He had his hip resurfs. He had the hip resurfacing, and he gave me a lot of confidence. Kind of he had that's the, that's the next level up. Um, and he said he plays amateur rugby now and he feels like a twenty year old. So that made me feel very good. Mike Haley's about to return for Munster. Oli Devoto plays for Exeter and Samson's plays for Marseille and he's tearing up. Um, so, yeah, it's a little WhatsApp group we could make, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, it was it was, it was was really tough when you, you're in the dark about things. But then once you speak to a lot of other people, or not a lot, a couple of other people, I think that helps reassure you. Yeah, yeah I, I had similar, but there were there's many different case studies of stress fractures in the spine for bowlers but i i actually remember speaking to it was a teammate at the time he's now the england women's head coach and he's been on the podcast john lewis and i remember sitting with john and saying like they've said this this and this and he was because usually you can be an, an, a, a bowler and you can come back from a stress fracture and I'd done it before, but this was a bit of yeah. a different, this was different. This was like, they're saying this shouldn't be doing this. And, and he said, look, mate, do you really want to have a, a, a rod in your spine? Like that's not a natural piece of kit to be in your, in, in a, well, he was, just, he was just like, it's, it's unnatural, obviously. And it's a, in, it's a very important part of your body that you don't really want to be messing around with for too much and yeah and obviously with hips is interesting isn't it because i've seen athletes who have had like complete hip replacements and they're absolutely fine because they're just the technology that you can get through those sorts of things is just incredible yeah. spine was just being a, it was just a little bit it was a bit gnarly for me and so yeah the, it, that, that you, decision would you change anything to kind of looking back at kind of your approach to things because that's that was a big question as well. As soon as it popped up, I was like, I, I looked, I looked straight back really before looking forward. And I think you look at kind of what's well, my professional, been a professional after seven, eight years, and then obviously you've got stuff that you did when you were in your childhood. Um, and I know I probably definitely would change a few things. So you mean the way in which you played, or like you mean yeah, the way you the, trained the way and things like that? Yeah, yeah. I think for me, I would have. Or oh, sorry, yeah. did you look back as, and look at your journey and how you got to yeah. do it's, that? It's a really good question. I don't know and I don't think I would because, again, my condition being asymmetrical in my body puts a lot of pressure on my left side. So I think I technically made the most of my physical condition that I had to get to where I was. And that literally is, I'm proud of that. Yeah. And the caveat is that it possibly caused and it still causes me issues on a daily basis and I just have to deal with that. And so I weigh up the whole did I know better, should I know better? And also the era, I'd say, which sounds crazy just being at thirty three, but like in cricket in general, in two thousand and fifteen uh, two thousand and five was when I first started like getting into the gym. And I remember on my first strength and conditioning coach was an ex uh, Northampton Saints SNC, and the thing that he did was essentially like bulk us up and get us really strong and robust and be like right you you basically went through all this hypertrophy like you guys really? would have done yeah and then so I weighed 94 95 kilos and I'm like right now I've got yeah. running and bowl and I'll be like tearing hamstrings and then like two three well then I get into like my 20s and I have two knee surgeries so Definitely, I would have conditioned myself different. But the uh, the question is, did I know better? Not really. Like, did I yeah. have enough information? Not really. Was there information overload like we've got now? Not really. And so I couldn't have done anything different, I don't think. I think technically, you usually look at technique and things like that in something like bowling. So are you collapsing? Are you moving? And I did that work. I really did that remedial work. I did it to 
stop anything happening on the right side, but then unfortunately uh, it just then injured the left side. And yeah, yeah, I'd, I think I would do things differently from a muscle point of view. So from like, I used to tear muscles, tammies and quads. So I would definitely have introduced yoga early on. I did that a lot. Yeah. I would have introduced that like as soon as I'd gone into some sort of like junior setup and be, I would again, be like the ghost of Christmas past, try to look, tell my younger yeah. self and be like, this is what you're going to get when you're older. Like try and yeah. do this. And I, I would definitely do, add that in because I think the flexibility, the ability to hold your body in different positions with strength and flexibility would have help, helped me, but not from a structural spinal, like bone it. Yeah. Place. It's interesting, isn't it? I think, especially the way the sports or sports going at the minute is, is not having to lift as much weight as possible. It's definitely in rugby because you do have it. You have to have an element of that for so the hypertrophy side of it. But in terms of kind of that sort of stuff, it's just how well can you move with, with just body weight? And I think that's so important. Probably a point that gets missed or jumped out, hurdled over, then revisited when you're when the issues body. arise. Yeah, exactly. And I agree with you. As far as you do, only kind of start doing that stuff until you learn the lesson for yourself, which is pretty powerful in itself. So, what lesson did you learn? What do you, what would you have potentially changed then, if you were reflecting back? In terms of, do you know, I was saying at the start, in terms of everything I do is probably obsessional um, and not not done half heartedly. I think being able to relax and and do less is, is is doing more sort of thing i think especially the first three years of my career it was just go 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 uh, we were kind of I, when i say we i talk about me and my brother um we were thrown into things pretty like straight away at 18 lift this you with the first team do this with the first team um and you, you you're you're going against people who have been doing this their whole career yeah. Um, and then obviously COVID happened. We were in the gym, just lifting as heavy as possible, as much as possible. Um, so I think it's that side is more like the 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 approach to to training. I think definitely would change. Is he the or same? Will. Is 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 Ben the same? Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. You've just you've bounced that energy off each other. Yeah. Well, even when we were kind of. Growing up, we'd be in the gym and it would it would always be competing against each other, like kind of lifting heavier and heavier. And it, and it would ultimately just go like this, wouldn't it? Until, yeah. we, until, until we are here. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of just that ability to relax. But I think the best thing for me is kind of I got this at 25. A, it's the best time to recover being being young. But B, is kind of you're able to, you're able to adapt an approach now. I'd rather have it now. And have it at 29 where you can't really do a lot about it but for me now i can and i think i'm really lucky in that regard i'm a big believer in that especially with uh young athletes getting injured early and i don't know too much about your injury history early but for me i got injured at like i said 16 and i'd look back at it and go it was the best thing that ever happened to me it moved yeah. me into getting into the gym looking after my body nutrition just and then even from a characteristic point of view discipline wanting to commit to this and actually having your goal kind of taken away from you and then you're like no i really want this and it just fueled the fire so i think there's always something that you can learn from that at a young age while it can be really scary and it can be really uh, unknown there's gonna be so many unknowns i think it's i think it's a big lesson and one that kind of always say oh, well, i I hope a young person gets that injury and doesn't feel invincible and then they get smart about it because, yeah, you see anyone who's later on in their professional career or any career, they're like, you got to smarten up at some stage. Like your, yeah. your body catches up and you're like, no, I'll be all right. I'm in, I, I can run through a wall. So like, well, yeah, see how that goes for you. Yeah, exactly. I think that was kind of the first, I reckon it was the first four years, definitely. I, I, mean, you could, I could literally wake up I could have a pizza the night before because I needed to keep weight on. So I'd have a pizza the night before um, thinking I need to have the calories and then I'd just rock up into the gym. I could lift whatever I, I could and I'd go and train and then I'd be fine for the weekend. And then, yeah, it's kind of develops and then I t I've tore 
my, I basically, I did my left ankle, then I did my left hammy. Then this year, I've done my right hammy three times. The first one was kind of a mechanic. The first one, I was basically RDL'd with a 130 kg prop on the, on my back. So I, it is what it is. But after that, I just kept going and going. So it's kind of just seeing the balance between things from the left shift over to the right. And I think being being more intelligent in the way in the way you move. Yeah, definitely. So just as we sort of touched on there, you growing up with Ben, I heard you talk about you both playing cricket in the garden when you were yeah. when you were kids. Yeah. And as I heard in you love- talking about this, this is literally like my, myself and Brad. It was just the exact same. So going into the garden and pretending to be two teams and then playing like test matches full innings yeah. like going after it which one of you ended up being the the batter which one was the bowler oh well, we'd have hawkeye we'd had we, we made our own hawkeye as well we did the like, same we got a ladder and then we got the those old video cameras and stuck it down and to be fair every every time it hit the leg we'd go to a, a review um, and then we had these little markers to to kind of have the stumps in mind. They were like halfway down the wicket just to make sure we could see that the lights. It probably didn't make much sense, but it made sense in our heads. Um, but we'd always, we'd always, we'd, al- we'd alternate. We, we'd, everyone would love to bat. No one loves bowling. Um, but we wouldn't even bowl. We'd literally get it. We'd take the ball up and just like launch it at each other from kind of six metres away, seven metres away. Because then you could see the ball properly swing both ways. It was unbelievable. It's such a fun game. But our dad in the summer, it was we basically created a square on the garden because yeah. we we'd run this bit and this bit would get yellow and he'd have a go at us. We'd have to move down and that bit would get yellow. So we'd have to. So by the end of the become like August, um, the garden on would ha- literally have like two kind of rough patches running. Perpendicular, um, sorry, parallel along the gar- along the garden. My our dads would definitely need to have a conversation because we did the exact same thing. We basically yeah ran in from well, we didn't move. That was the thing. We create like a crater at one stage in our in our garden <laughs> where it was just like a, a, a yeah. dip. Our dad would get nut go nuts at us, and we're like, I think one day he would be like, right, you got to move. You can't play there. And then we came back and we like actually cut a pitch. We 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 basically yeah. draw, and then put lines on, <laughs> and properly done it. But I mean, stuff, there's so much you can take from stuff like that. Just the I always say the fact that I had my brother really benefited me and allowed me to to make I, I really think make it because it was not only the competitive spirit but like the creativity that you have within that and being able to. Yeah, be creative with all of these different things. I think was such a a benefit, and I, there's still stuff of that that you. Do, I look back now and go, well, I took sort of that mindset and that approach of how I went about things, and and while it was fun, like there was so much I got out of that that actually made me make it. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, you you do think even did you play any other sports as well or was it just so cricket? I got to about fourteen where I then I was I played golf played golf but I definitely gave up football pretty early because I was yeah. pretty adamant that I wanted to play cricket and so I didn't have multi disciplines in in that sense so yeah gave up other sports and then went all in on cricket sort of fourteen fifteen okay it's, it's it's always interesting kind of growing up especially with rugby players. There is always, there's not always, that's, that's not the right thing, but there is definitely an element of a lot of cricket players that, or, or rugby players that have played cricket. Mm. Um, and, and those that have done, have always had very good hand-eye coordination. They're usually the ones who are, who are good with the ball skills and, um, and different bits and bobs. Like you look at Jamie George, a hooker, unbelievable at cricket, and he, he's throwing the ball in and he's, he's one of the best front rowers at kind of tipping the ball. Elliot Daly under the high ball. He's, he swears he could have made it a professional cricket. Probably could have. Um, well, especially the way he plays when we're, when we're off the pitch. So as, it's, it's interesting when people play different sports, especially growing up, because you can see it, and especially you can see it when they are the professional they are um, and the way they play, because I feel like it's it's a lot more instinctive or it's, um, 
trying to say it, it, it just feels a lot more kind of natural especially with the growing up with just sport this isn't just multi-sports but just sport in general if they're growing up with it um you can you can kind of see it there's also the think the element of cricket that is not necessarily always spoken about especially right now is um the the discipline that it brings and the the sort of the mentality that you have to have in it because it's a an annoying sport essentially it's so frustrating yeah. you're, you're you're out more than you're in and you, you've got you're failing way more than you're 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 actually succeeding but it's that it's it's the gift that keeps on giving it just holds you in long enough to just keep you <laughs> yeah, going yeah. and you 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 just keep going with it but i think it's a great leveler it's a great level it, it gives you the the Again, like you said, the, the multidisciplinary skills that you can get through hand-eye coordination, the intricate skills with your body. Learn, obviously, you're in a weird side-on positions that you're getting your body into, so holding your body in different sides. But then, really, the mentality that it takes, like focusing, switching on and off in between balls, like trying to be consistent, trying to repeat. There's so many different things there that you can take out of it. And yeah, I've, I've, I know a lot of players, even in in the professional cricket space, that played rugby. I played with uh, Rory Hamilton Brown, and he was really good mates with Danny Cipriani, and they yeah. were they were both. Even when we do warm ups, it played like a rugby warm up. You just saw yeah. Rory was unbelievable. He just like switched into rugby <laughs> mode, and you're like, God, blimey! <laughs> so, yeah, it comes out very quickly, doesn't it? Um, but I do think it is it's really important. And, and going back to our point of the garden, like we played football in the in the garden, we played rugby the whole time in the garden together. But I think the one thing that was the best thing was was, was definitely cricket. Um, yeah, you'd be you'd be out there for hours. It would go dark, and kind of one of us, we'd have a little test match. I don't think anyone ever won a game. This was the thing, like you wouldn't, like you'd know subcon not subconsciously, but you'd know like who who won the game. But it was never recorded or anything, so it was always up for debate. Uh, we'd always have like best t- catch of the day, best wicket of the day best shots of the day um just like you could compete about every little bit um so no it was, it was it was a lot of fun i think that helped us massively um to be competitive because i think you do have to i think it is a learned trait when did when did you and ben then go all in when did you go right this is we're going to do this this rugby is the thing we're going for we didn't until we found out we were getting a professional contract at our sister's birthday really uh, yeah we 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 went to school we we all, I, I say that we always knew we rugby was our best sport and rugby was the one we probably enjoyed most but in terms of the way rugby goes is i don't know you you turn up and you do under 14s at sale and then you to kind of they do under 14s with cheshire the county then you just oh I got into this bit and I got into this bit and then before you know it you're 18 and you've got a professional contract it's you you never I never really thought that's exactly what I'm going to do sort of thing then when you are in that professional environment did you and Ben have a a shift in each other or did was it was it good that you were both going in together do you think it would have been a lot harder if you were going in on your own um yeah. Oh, it, def- it would definitely be harder. I think we, oh yeah, there was only me and Ben that signed. So that was quite weird within itself. Um, so so that made it a little bit tougher. But yeah, I, I, it, it was it was good. Like, did it change anything? Not really. I think we still knew a lot of people in the year above and everything. So. So yeah, I think the the main thing was like having someone to do something with after training was the big thing. Out of extra stuff, like we're obviously both the same position. We both have the same interests like in the game, so we always kind of had the extras. Like now, not nowadays, but if you wanted to get someone to do passing with, or you you you'd have to wait for a scrum half, or you know you wanted to work your lines off ten, you'd have to wait for a fly half. If you want to do breakdown. We the song right there, mm. so that helps. That did help enormously. Yeah, I I not considered that the after after training. Was there anyone around the group that you, you had as a role model that you were like these these people have either taken me under the wing at, at an early age and and then they've or someone that you aspired to be like 
Uh, we lucked out massively. We so there was um, growing up like uh, David Seymour, and Dan Braid with a seven and six for sale, and they were kind of two shorter um, back rowers because usually you pick like a tall, big six who can jump in the lineouts and a seven who can go over the ball. But these two did everything, um, so that was pretty pretty cool. Watch growing up and watching. So then when we joined the academy, I think Dan Braid just retired, so he became kind of, he became a coach. Um, I don't know what else, I think it was Braid, more Braid down defence orientated. But he also took me and Ben under his wing, and for the first year, we'd watch training, we'd go, um, sorry, we'd train, we'd go up and watch, watch it with him, we'd play a game, we'd go up and watch it with him. And he was an all-black, he was an unbelievable player for sale. Like Those two together revolutionised um, the tackle, it was called like the choke tackle at the time. Um, they used to hold people up for fun and kind of that changed a bit in the game. It was around 2014, 2015. So yeah, he was a very clever, intelligent player. But then getting to work with him and seeing how he saw the game, I think that changed everything as an 18-year-old. You uh, de- you debuted both professionally and then for England pretty young. What yeah. do you think have you... What, what has changed about you as a player since since then um more physical i think really yeah more more physical i think is that because the game has become more physical like the game is is sort of everyone it, it, i mean we see it in many sports as the strength and conditioning is progressing and there's always more data and training and is that because everyone is or just you felt i need to be more physical i think obviously working in the gym helps I think also kind of just the the technical stuff of, of the tackle and being smart around it. Like, you know, if someone's running at me full speed, you know to go low, high, make make tiny little decisions that that make a huge difference. Um, ultimately, you, you've got to want to do it. I think that's the first and foremost bit of it. But being technically smart and, and also being fit to be able to... There's loads of different components like line speed, like getting off the line. Do you go quick? Do you go slow? Um, adjustment from the player next to you, either side. Kind of, if you go tight, and you can see that they're going to tip it, then it's going to be pointless because they're going to get quite wide from you. But then, if you can see they're not going to tip it, then you want to be a bit tight. So I think knowledge as well. So I'm just going to say we need to simplify this, don't we? Well, um, the, the other thing as well is, is there anything that you think has had the biggest impact on your game that potentially has projected you forward? Um, in all honesty, I, ju- I, I just think it's been working at it. I think it's just being, when you can watch as, 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 as much as you want to watch on TV, you can watch as much analysis as possible. But I think when you when you approach training like you approach a game I think you're constantly learning I think as soon as you you go into a Monday or a Tuesday and you're kind of taking a back seat I think it's a wasted session whereas especially from 18 to kind of 24 every every session was kind of 100% and sometimes it's probably it tipped over the bar like we do a walkthrough and I think I'd be sprinting I know there's one where I'd be sprinting and everyone's like what are you doing and it's kind of like that was that was always kind of my thought process to it, whether I was, it was conscious or not. And I think that allowed me to just learn so much more because you're, you're getting all these, all this stimulus and all this kind of feeling and learning in a, on a Tuesday that people would probably get on a Saturday. I don't know. That's the way I think about it. Yeah, I, I get. And I hear a lot about how how you play the game and and the intensity you you playing it at. Is there kind of following on from that is there anything since you've come into the game professionally that you have had as yourself that is almost like a non-negotiable for you that you aren't willing to compromise on and something that has held you in good stead in your entire career so far yeah working the hardest i think i think it's also probably the thing that's got me in this position now um but i think that just being able to just work the hardest i think and you know that sometimes it's 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 killed me. Like I remember the G we get these GPS stats, and it would genuinely give me anxiety to see these GPS stats because if I wasn't doing this this this, 
And if mine wasn't like up here, then I, I would generally, I would feel like a bad person, um, which I think is really interesting. So I've had to change that, but I think, and this is what is a real conflicting idea is because you've got this thing that's been brilliant and done so well for you, but then you've got this thing that's also dragging you down. So it's kind of weighing, weighing it up and having a healthy relationship between both. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been interesting. That's interesting that you're almost your own strength can be your own Achilles heel. And I think that's definitely, there's definitely lots of, of that going on as well. I, I have oh. huge amounts of perfectionism in, in my life. And that for me is great because you set these really high standards of yourself. And that's actually sort of a big trait of perfectionism. But the problem is, is that you just want everything to be in line and imperfect and, and make sure it's, it's right. And before you make the, the, the move and, yeah, that's the the drawback. So there's always these beautiful paradoxes that happen when you've got this, I think, with, with a, a really strong trait. And I think it's something that's really common in sport. People that have these these elite traits that people want to have, whether it's your work rate or your diligence or your organization, whatever it might be, it comes at a cost somewhere. Like there's always yeah. a cost. It's, it's checks and balances. It's, there's always something, a drawback that it happens. And, and people... I always saying to them, like, you, you have to be aware of that. Like, that's a part of the sacrifice of you want to work hard, you want to be as physical as you've been. Like, there is going to be a cost somewhere. So it's like, what cost do you want? Yeah, it's, it is interesting. I think for me, especially, you, and this is the thing, this is why I don't have any regrets about that is because you told me that as an 18-year-old, I would not listen to anyone. I, I wouldn't listen to myself now. Um and I wouldn't want to kind of, the, the whole thing is to be, and I think the whole thing is about self-discovery and I think the whole, and it's about being yourself. Um, and for me, if, if you have to be like, a, if you have to kind of, I, I wouldn't be able to control that. You, you get me on a pitch and I, I can't run at 60%. It's either 0% or 100%. Um, so I think for me, it's, especially with this injury, is it's, it's learning that. Do you think um, do you think there's a risk of people potentially holding definitely young people back through being a little bit too careful about things? Now I don't say that especially in I, I don't take away the dangers that exist in rugby, so I don't almost mean from like a contact, but I yeah. I mean from you hear a lot of especially in the psychology space, a lot of being about psychological safety, making sure people are safe, hurt and things like that. And I I tussle with that sometimes in the sense that I believe that there is a moment where you've got to be, it, it, there's just non-negotiables. This is this is going to be hard. This is going to be challenging and you're going to be better off the other end of it. Yeah, it's, it's tough. It's, it's such a weird time. Like even in, I'm not saying I've had a, a long career by any chance, by, um, mm -hmm. but I'm, I think you, you've just seen the change even in the last kind of five years of, of how everything's gone. Um, whether that's the sale thing, because I know we've had Alex Anderson come in and he's very, big on, on, on that sort of stuff and um, but it's, it's like with everything and I said before everything has a balance I think I've been very lucky in my career that I've had a coach like Steve Diamond who was who made lads run with whilst eating chocolate eclairs, uh, chocolate eclairs and and, uh, and these pastry donuts um, and a full fat coke because they bought crisps on the, on the, on the bus back from a, from a game instead of beers um, and then we kind of go to Alex and he's, he's a lot more, um, you know, person first and player, player second. Um, so explain that a little bit more. What was going on with the eclairs and the, oh, so we, 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 we were getting a bus back from a game once and it was my brother actually, cause we were 18 at the time. We always, so first of all, the youngest always made the coffees on the bus and like, without a doubt, there was no questions asked. Um, so that's been, that's basically gone now. Um, and then we were on a bus back from the game. And I think you, naturally you're going to be a bit hungry. So the lads have got, so we always stop off, sorry, to get a load of beers and stuff, especially if it's a three, four hour journey back from kind of Exeter. Anyway, Rob Webber's told my brother to go get a load of snacks. And this is all done on the, on the sale credit card. Get back. Anyway, long story short, we're in on Monday. And it dines tells us all to like line up on the on the try line, and he, he starts going off about. I don't. I, I honestly, I don't have a clue. 
but he he starts handing these like cream filled pastries out to to Rob Webber, another player, my brother, um, so he has to um, finish off a full fat coke, and then he makes us run. And then whilst they're all eating, they're like throwing up and running like by the side, but they just have to carry on running. Um, so that was a that was a bit of an eye opener. And that was because the beers didn't get bought. It was it's basically because we got snacks instead of beers. So yeah, <laughs> that kind of thing that. Basically, I'm highlighting that the mentality of rugby is completely changed. Yeah, I mean, not that when I first went into, I mean, geez, when I first went into a cricket changing room, that sort of again in the 2005, like there were players that I played with that would have a jug of beer all to themselves after the first day of play, <laughs> and uh, there were players that would be out the night before a game, or they'd be out the day or day two of the game and then they'd sort of come at stumbling into the hotel in the morning of a game but geez i'll tell you one thing that even with characters like that and you might have seen them is that there are these characters that that do that and then they will show up for like when they turn up for training they hit a switch and it's it's you almost can't argue with them sometimes and you balance yeah. between going well do they need that in order to be in the space and at the quality that they're at in order to have the freedom and the 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 self-expression that they have or whatever it is that might be on the field, do they need that release to go and do that, to be that type of maverick? Or the other end of that is, are they getting everything out of them? But those people ended up being some of the best players I ever played with and their stats yeah. were like unbelievable and they're yeah. incredible. So you're sort of going, I, I don't, tearing the hair out, you don't know what the answer is. Yeah, it's you could. I was thinking this the other day actually. Like the balance of people is so important, especially in team sports. Cricket's a bit different because ultimately you 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 come back to being an individual, I guess. Um, but with rugby, like if if two things, the twos, one thing could happen. So one thing could happen to two people. Like the same thing could happen to two people in cricket. The same thing could only probably happen to one person. I think where the rugby differs slightly is because how the, the 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 coach or the players around react to the two different people where the same thing has happened. Does that yeah. make sense? I think I, I think so. Yeah. I, I think it, two people. So let's say there's a tackle and two people are in it. Both of them miss it. I think the approach to both people is extremely different because of the the personalities, the character, um, who they are, kind of obviously the situation they're in. But I think. I, th I think that's important, especially in man management. I think Eddie was unbelievable at that. He always got that right. And it's back to kind of this, um, you know, the players who are, you know, the ones who are joking around in training or, 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 or most relaxed. Um, that's how you get the best out of them. Whereas the ones like me who are much more serious, usually who took themselves more seriously, usually got taken serious, more seriously by other coaches or, or harder on by other coaches because that's how you, you react and that's how you work. The, ch the challenge I think becomes when you as a player potentially project what you think is right for another player onto them. And a coach can do that as well. So yeah. you, you may see another player deal with a situation, whether it's an interaction in the team or something that's happening in a game and a player reacts or does something that doesn't sit with, whether it's your values, how you do things. And yeah. you can instantly go, that's not right. That's not right. That's not how you do this. And I've seen that happen in, in teams where the, the coach tries to place their expectation of what the player should be like based on what their expectation is rather than actually going well what is it? curiosity really coming forward and asking well what does that player need is that exactly what's working for them and I think sometimes the challenge does become and I think sport is getting better at this now is doing that at an earlier stage I saw it much more leeway happen to prof professionals who were Rightly so, they, they were bedded into their careers. They had stats behind them. They had p performances. So they kind of got, wouldn't say a little bit more slack, but there was a bit more understanding for them. Whereas yeah. like young people, I think you can get put through a bit of a cookie cutter mold approach sometimes and being like, you need to act like this to get this outcome. I think yeah. we're changing in that way in some sense yeah. where it's like, well, what do you need? How, how do you get the best out of that person? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because... And this is one of the things I was saying, like the difference between 18 and kind of now is 18 year old me, 
I would have been, yeah, everyone has to be the same. You know, if you want to achieve this goal, you have to do this to get that. But I, and this, you can only really get this from experience, I guess, is kind of, you look at me now at 25, I'd say that's absolutely completely wrong. And I think, and, and this is kind of the journey of self-discovery is the, is the most important thing I have to think about being a sports person is, is, is kind of the ebbs and flows and everything changes. Um, and I think that's, if, if I was to highlight something for kind of a young athlete, I think that would be the most important thing is, is cause you get asked the question, you would have got asked the question the whole time is what did you do as a sportsman? You know, why did you make it? What was the main thing? And ultimately they, you have to, there's the cliche answer of you got to love it, but also you just got to accept it and kind of stuff will come, stuff will go. Um, as long as you're willing to change and you're willing to get better and that comes from a love of the sport and the game because that's what it does boil down to I, I think then, then then that's ultimately it and it is the most you get the most frustrated faces from these kids because it's going to be like you have to do this and you will be unbelievable but it's never it's never that is it well I think that's a big message to send is the fact that I, and I encourage this is that sport doesn't really care about you you have to mold yourself to what the environment is so you there is this element of if you're stepping into a professional environment while there will be many different resources or there are many many different sort of safeties made for you there are accommodations made for you you have to adapt yourself to the environment you have to find your way in yeah. the world and in the sport and that's almost non-negotiable and I think when people go, well, why is it not working for me? My comeback is, well, well, how are you making it work for you? How can yeah. you make this environment work for you? You might, you might be in an environment where the coach, you just don't gel with the coach well enough, or you don't get on with this teammate over here, or just things aren't exactly perfect for you. Yeah. So find your way, find the way in which you're going to make it work for yeah. you. And it is it's absolutely different for everyone. I think the more you kind of see that because you, you hear stories like johnny wilkinson you know he he did everything he just kicked and he kicked and he kicked and look how good he was as a player but then you you look at yourself and you, you can't just compare yourself to people i think that's that was a really important lesson because you know it's not just you know hammering the nail hammering the nail there's a lot of other things with it how did you deal with growing up with ben obviously oh, like literally identical twins so you, how do you how do you deal with potentially having that comparison to each other growing up and then at one stage having a bit of separation, your careers have separated somewhat and having that sense of I've now forging my own path, not alongside him and doing my own thing? Uh, to say, it's, it's a lot easier to answer now because I think we're, we're, we're sort of past that um, or we understand it more, sorry. I think... It was it was it was pretty tough early on. We always knew we were slightly different in the way we played, and I think that was important. The kind of we weren't always we were quickly. I think the main thing is we were quickly um, separated in the way people thought about us and in, in the way we played. Like he was better on the ball, better at kind of passing that sort of stuff. I was better at basically hitting things. So we actually worked together. We worked together really well. Like we, and I think that's the bit that's. I think that is the best bit, and that's a lot. That's we are very lucky in that regard. Like we can play six and seven, um, and we weren't both pigeonholed as seven. We weren't both pigeonholed as six, um, and that's credit to Sale and how they developed us. Like we were able to kind of just develop ourselves and be ourselves rather than we weren't compared to each other. Um, but I think Ben would be a better person to answer the question of of what it was like when we were kind of going our own separate ways because I went to, to England for a bit and he, he stayed at Sale um, and it, it was obviously tough and I think but he's the sign of the person he is, is is the fact that he's able to he was able to recognise it um, it was obviously tough you know the, the times he wouldn't come to Twickenham because people would he'd be sat in the crowd and people would be like why aren't you getting ready to play and he'd be like are you, are you done? Like I think it was a semi-final. No, it, was, it was before the final. He flew out in Japan, and obviously he was with my mates in the bar in Japan somewhere, just having a few drinks the night before. And someone came up to it. It was kind of like, 
why are you not getting ready for the for the final? Why why are you here? And I think stuff small stuff like that can make a, a, a huge difference. But he's dealt with it very well. Are those like uh, joke? Is that people joking or is that actually no, no, people are consciously no, say, yeah. taking the mic? Yeah, uh, no, they generally don't know because <laughs> right. So to me and Ben, like we're identical twins, like that's us. And yeah. you wouldn't expect what's obviously naive of us is that you wouldn't expect people to not know that we are identical twins, like because we've always known it. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> really so it's like when Scott says that you do think they're taking the piss, but people generally don't know sometimes. Um so so yeah, back to the back to the thing. I think um he got a probably a bit more of a raw deal from it. But I think ultimately as a person and as a player, you, you do benefit from it long term. But I think the maturity and the time of the person you are is how you give up the stuff in the short term or how you handle your emotions, sorry, in the short term. Yeah, wow. That it was there that sort of path change for you. Was it? How did you deal with it? In the sense of you're now going from we. I've heard you talk about you would always describe we, and and it's yeah. you and Ben, and then you realise that it's now got to be me. And yeah. is, there, is there like a sense of I don't know guilt where you you feel like I'm I'm going off and doing this now for myself uh yeah a bit um especially kind of when you're you're leaving with your bags and stuff it was a bit weird especially early on um but yeah it's ultimately you have to do what you have to do i think for him obviously the journey was harder but for me you 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 have to grow up and 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 learn you you are your own person and you are your own journey kind of you know, the analysis, as we were talking about Dan Bray before, the analysis where we go from me and Dad and him next to a laptop watching kind of clips of both of us to go from just me watching clips about myself. I think just small stuff like that, which don't seem like a big deal, but like small stuff you have to adapt to, um, I think I think was very important. Yeah. And I guess there's so many people that listen right now that they're they're constantly comparing themselves to other people anyway. They're constantly comparing themselves to whether it's a teammate, doesn't necessarily got to be a sibling. I think you've got such you've definitely got one of the sort of the closest bonds in the sense of that experience for comparison to someone else. It's the closest yeah. I know of. But the everyone else out there will be trying to I think the goal really to get the best out of yourself is to really just look at your own path to really yeah. look at what you are doing and getting the best out of yourself I, it, and, and it is credit to someone like ben to say that as you have gone off on your own path he hasn't lost sight of his he's still yeah. playing like he's still a, a leading professional and the other option would have been resentment bitterness and that could have just completely had a, a negative impact on his performance and, and play and you might not be playing. And there's these different sliding door moments that might happen. But yeah, you're right. It is, it is credit. And I think for people out there, that the ability to stay strong on your own path and your own vision and what are my goals set and how am I going to achieve what I need? It sounds selfish, but it's kind of what's needed. Yeah, without a doubt. I think even to go further than that is to kind of, it's not just to find your own path, but to find the happiness within it in terms of, and I don't mean happiness as in, oh, everything has to be smiley and you have to love every moment because you don't. Like some moments you hate it, but find genuine happiness where you're, you're content with just worrying about yourself. Like I know, especially in team sports, you can you talk about selection a lot um, and you can, you know, find more unhappiness with you can find unhappiness with selection and, and kind of resentment for someone in your position who's been selected but i think if you're genuinely content and genuinely genuinely and this is the difference between happy and like genuinely happy if you're genuinely happy about kind of being there and being in the process and 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 your journey then you, you won't see kind of someone else's someone else's success or someone else's demise as a change to you like that the external environment will won't change kind of your internal environment. I think that's that's really important. Yeah, that, that's that's so true. So with the the last few months have been, a, I, I reckon that's been a hell of a roller coaster for you. Just the unsure about the start of the World Cup, then getting it, and then the World Cup, and then the the team actually performing in the World Cup the way you did. 
Is there anything now with the sort of the dust settling that from a team's performance, the actually England, how well you did, what you've potentially taken away from it and look back at that whole experience? Oh, I, I love I love World Cups. I say that I've done done two now, and I love World Cups because there's thirty well thirty one last one thirty three in this one, and you are all in there together for what what would we've been there for the for let's say eight weeks. No one's really coming and going apart from injury, so you basically you, you just have to knuckle down if in terms of selection. So only twenty three of you can play. So the other 10, this is, and this comes back to the, the, the genuine kind of being genuinely happy to be a part of the process is sometimes you might not be in the game, but that doesn't mean you're not in the process. And I think over the, those eight weeks, they make you feel so strongly about something like that. And they make you realize kind of how, what position you need to get yourself into to, to, to understand something like that. Because I think a lot of people listening would, would go, okay, yeah, I, I can be genuinely happy. But kind of when you're stuck with each other for eight weeks, and I know um, some players who, who who probably only played one game, and they have to they obviously they weren't happy with it. But you have to be you know happy with the process and and being able to still contribute to the team and contribute to the process of of trying to win the World Cup. You might not play, but you, you you're still in the process. Um, and I think that was the the biggest learning curve of something like that, so or a tournament like that is being stuck together like that. I, there's something interesting that Mark Cavendish said in an interview recently around Tour de France riders and the teams in there. How there's guys in the peloton and in teams in the in the squads that, but uh, riders within the, the the teams of on the yeah. on, on the on the peloton that they are they are punishing themselves. Their, their number one goal is to punish themselves to go into the hurt locker for someone else to win, and yeah. that that is, is this like self sacrificing vision that they have. And I uh, I find that really interesting around something like rugby, where you do have a, a huge squad. Obviously, you have to because of the the physicality, the potential injuries that can come, and those people that are that are not playing that are in the squad, but they are they're at training they're putting in the effort and I think that is a it's a part of obviously being a part of a team but I don't think gets enough credit and enough spotlight sometimes to allow the people that are on the team to perform because again they're the ones that get put up in lights they're the ones that get the accolades the stories but it's always a case of if the others weren't there where would the others on the field be exactly kind of if if we win everyone wins and then you know that you might have the twenty three that will win, but everyone will win if if there's, it sounds like you kind of it sounds a bit kind of going crazy, but if you ultimately if the twenty three do the best that they can and the the ten that were 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 there to prepare them the best that they can, the whole team wins. I think it isn't something that you wake up and go, yeah, that's happened. But I think you look we look back now, you go, yeah, you know, we were playing. We just found out about a selection and then we were playing paddle with guys and everyone was loving it. Or we just found out about a selection, we'd just go in the gym and we'd be spotting each other, pats on the back, and then we'd go, right, let's crack on. And I think you only, you, at the time, you think that's normal, but you look back and go, well, they could have easily just kicked off and kind of pulled away. And I think back to your question is that is definitely the most important part of a, of a tournament like that. Do you you guys were not given as a squad as a team a squad given much hope going in? So that was the mindset. Yeah, we didn't we, help ourselves. <laughs> well, but what was the mindset going in? Was there a bit of a let's show? Was was it a bit of a let's show them? Was it well, let's play carefree? I mean, the first half of the South Africa game like was un, unreal. Like I was like, they, they, it looked from outside that it was a. Uh, Let's give this one hundred and ten percent, and at least give do that. Yeah, you, you'd hope that you, everyone would give a hundred percent. You're playing for your country. I think it was more the fact that it was like a fuck it, like fuck it attitude. Like, you know, we lost basically we lost three games in the preseason, one to Fiji that we weren't expecting. I think it was more like we're out in France. 
And I think that's the beauty of a World Cup is once you get over to, to France, it was like, right, let's just, this is it now. Like, you don't have to hold anything back. Like, you don't have to worry about, you know, this or this. It's just like, right, let's just, let's just attack it. Um, and this is what I mean. Once you're in it and everyone's kind of bought in while you're out, whilst you're out there, it's, everyone just throws himself at it and it, you, you don't get, unless you've been in it, you, you won't understand the feeling like you will when you're in a team and it's, and it's going well and you can feel everyone going behind you. Um, it's, it's a feeling like you can't, you can't say, oh, we did this in the week and this in the week. And then we got the feeling like it, it just happens. It's, it's the strangest thing. And it, it just happened. Um, like we didn't change anything in training. We may have had, we had a bollocking or two, which I think we needed. Um, but apart from that, it was kind of, we just threw ourselves at it and we, we really had a feeling that it was kind of us against everyone else. Um, and I think the game plan, especially against South Africa was very good. Yeah. No, so there's obviously the world cup coming back, the dust settling and the controversies around it after and, and the stories. And I'm not going to go into those, but Owen Farrell's stepped away for a bit. How, how, what does that do in the the landscape of, of rugby? Because I, I've come from a sport where we've had, I, I had teammates. I had teammates that were playing for England and they stepped away because of the game that they had a lot going on for themselves. But, and that was more an, intern, an internal for them. Whereas there's, for you guys, you've had externals that have come in and, and, and potentially added to that pressure. And I again, social media is just fueling the fire more than I've ever experienced, never seen. So I've not really experienced a, 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 an environment or a, a changing room where that plays a part. So through what's happened, what have, have you learned for yourself? But that will, also do you see what's going on with Owen and how that helps the game moving forward? Oh, I think first and foremost, it's, it's really powerful. I think, especially from my experiences, is it, and, I, and then to I keep saying this is another lesson learned, but from the World Cup, especially the biggest lesson I learned was the the the, the importance of of the people around you, and the, the the thing that meant the most was the small group of circle, the small circle of people that are around you, kind of family, friends obviously teammates and coaches um, kind of probably sit outside that, but like the, the people who are properly close around you, I think it, something like that makes you, makes you realize that it, it, that's the only thing that matters. You can get caught up in, oh, what was this, this review or what, what are they saying about it? Um, especially with the way kind of social media goes, it's kind of everywhere. Um, but I think when something like that happens, um, I think that it, it hits you right in the face. It's kind of, it does not matter what anyone says about you. Um, it only matters kind of what the, the, the closest people around you think, um, which was a pretty powerful experience in itself, I think. I think with the Owen Farrell situation at the moment, one thing that I see that it's opened the eyes of everyone is that rugby players, you can physically look at you guys and go, you're just giants and you are these hyper masculinized guys that are the strongest of the athletes that we have essentially and that it is okay to give yourself some space to give yourself yeah. some time to go do you know what this game is more than just physical my i am more than just an athlete uh there's so many components to me and i think it really humanizes the experience yeah. and People can say whatever they want, but I'm always a big believer in you. You cannot judge someone until you've walked ten feet in their shoes to to know what's going on. And yeah. I think, do do you see this now empowering not just sport in general, but actually having an impact within cultures within within changing rooms, say like in the Premiership and other leagues around around the world? Yeah, I, I think so. I think. Um especially kind of in England it's all about it's all about playing for England and and you know you, you finish one tournament and it's right what when's the next tournament and then you've got the, the the premiership games in between and I I think you get very caught up in the cycle of right 
getting on tournament here, right? I'm going to throw myself into that, you know, a week or two off, right? Premiership, I've got a, premiership, a block of premiership games. I'm going to throw myself into that, right? Back into the England setup. What am I doing with England? Back, got a week off, right? I'm back into the premiership. And you get caught in this cycle, I think, um, for him to, or for anyone to kind of, you know, take a step back and, and realise not for himself, but his family, his family and his kids. I think is um, extremely important and, and, and powerful. And I think not just for for sport and rugby in general. It's kind of for people. It's like you've got to do what what means most to you, um, and it's not about just doing the normal thing. It's not about just doing the thing for the for the most amount of money. It's it's kind of just going back and going right. What will actually genuinely make me happy? Um, so yeah, I think it's pretty pretty important. Yeah, I think there's there's so many people that don't really like I, even I don't understand it fully now because again when I was pl- when I was playing and I'm only talking about I finished what seven years ago so yeah. e- e- even social media just the, the the pure speed at which it has progressed and the our interaction with it and both from a positive and a massively negative aspect it's really hard to just say what that experience is like. Again, there'd be so many people that will hold opinions on a topic like this and be like, well, should just sort of brush it off or should like move aside. And you go, well, hold on. You're not getting thousands of people coming at you, questioning parts about you, like every move you as any, as anything, like you're, you're already scrutinized over every move and, and play that you make and pass and tackle. And, and did you do the right thing here? And, let alone people bringing in family and yeah. bringing in other people so yeah I, it's a it's it is such a i mean social media can be great but it can be the cesspit and and i think Without a doubt. you have to now it's a new space for athletes to navigate and it really needs attention and it needs real strength of character going into sport now to understand that this is a this is another world. And like you said, you couldn't have put it better to know the people around you matter most. I think it was Tom Tom Holland, the actor Spider-Man, yeah. that, that said this great phrase that if someone's if someone says something about me, if they know me, text me. But if they don't have my number, they don't matter. Yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's brilliant. So it oh. is, especially coming with social media at the minute as well, kind of everyone has access to everyone and it's 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 all kind of like that and it's is i think for fifth no more than that for 80 percent of the time it's beautiful because you you're able to connect with people who you know me growing up i was watching let's say i was watching sebastian chabelle i had no the only contact i ever had was meeting jason robinson in a car park like i think and that was an unbelievable occasion so for now for, for there to be more access it's brilliant but some people realize kind of five seconds out of their day to, to, to go out of their way to do something negative, kind of, that's someone, that's more than five seconds in, in, in their life. That's probably kind of three or four hours, kind of, that a comment takes out of them sort mm-hmm. of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, it's a careful space, but it's, it's one that's, it's, it should be really positive, but it's just, I don't know, it's... Yeah, I mean, I find it even with the content that I put out there, I put out as much positivity as I can through things, trying to educate people, inspire them, motivate them. And I will still get comments on there about like, who's this bull guy that's just, or like having a crack at me on there. And I, really? I, 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 I my approach is I message them. My approach is I, I, really? I go, well, you, you walk into my house, I'm going to come, I'm going to, I'm going to say hello to you. Like, <laughs> yeah. And there's a I great, there's a great thing that uh, Tim, Tim Ferris said which was about his how he blocks people on social media how he if someone comes in and comments negatively he, he blocks them or removes their comment his approach is you come into my social media you've come into my house take your fucking shoes off and uh, I, yeah i love it I, uh, so i have the approach of like if you want to do that i will comment i will i will reach out if i see it or have time or whatever and i will go what's going on what's what's here well, and obviously I laugh it off sometimes because I go, this person doesn't know me. Like this person really doesn't, yeah. I don't know who this person is. Like if, again, if you yeah. don't have my number, I don't need to hear from you. If you have my number, text me. Yeah, it's a very good point. And that usually it's kind of, I'm so sorry sort of thing. Yeah, and it, well, honestly, the speed of the turnaround 
because they don't expect it. It's just they're throwing stones from from behind a wall and then you realize there's a door in the wall and you open up the door and go sorry what was that and they go oh no yeah. don't mean, don't mean yeah. to don't mean to do that yeah yeah but uh look mate we we've gone through a serious amount of time here so and i appreciate it um what what sort of the obviously you've got the injury right now and you are trying to get that get that healed up is there anything that you're sort of developing on the side that that, that you're actually when you've got time off, do you throw yourself into anything that's some sort of passion that you, you have outside of rugby? Uh, so, yeah, I kind of run, well, I was having, that's hard to say, isn't it? Um, basically, I've just got a few a property portfolio that I try to manage. Um, so I do that. I've got interest in, a big interest in watches. Um, so it's, it's more kind of financial stuff, which, which obviously helps. Um, but which I didn't mean how it makes it more interesting, I guess. Um, so just try and that's kind of the part time stuff, really. My my Keep... friend, my friend Toby, he's a, a big keen rugby player as well. He, he, uh, he's got a session with watches. Like, what is it with yeah, what, what, I don't have, watches, I don't coffees. have that gene. <laughs> I don't have that gene. Like, I don't know what it yeah. is. I've got my, I've got my Garmin here. My Garmin is, is my absolute world at the moment, but that's hey. it. I don't need anything else. I don't need a, another watch. It could, probably deal with a casio that's about it my girlfriend's the same she's got a garbage for christmas and so she can't wait <laughs> which one is it uh it's the epics epics 2 okay that's... it is honestly oh, okay. it's so the smaller one it's so good like Everyone i raves about absolutely it. You watch, like... love it honestly my garmin is i'm so glad i purchased this it's really i'm really glad with the garmin epics 2 yeah it's, it's a good piece of kit because she, she's looking forward to it because you don't need your head no you don't need your phone when you're running when it's can do yeah you can log it up to spotify you can you can put all that and then the battery lot so i i had an i had an apple watch but yeah. you used to have to take it off and charge it every night and yeah this this i have it on i have it on essentially all the settings that it requires to be a, a good high performance level and I charged it yesterday and I've got 16 days of life going. If I didn't have all those settings on, it could it shoots up to like 48 days. And I think the Fenix, which is their, one of their like big top end ones, that they're sort of not, this is a top end one essentially, but like there's the Fenix, which is like their, their flagship that they've had for a long time. That's like 64 out, uh, 64 days sometimes. If you get the solar one and yeah, they've, they've nailed the battery lives. That's me. I had no idea. I thought it was a day on day off sort of thing. No, I, I, that was the thing. I ha I wanted to be able to track sleep and things like that. And it's been brilliant for that where I've been able to, and I don't want to get too caught up in data. I'm big on feel and understanding. But one thing it has been able yeah. to do is actually go, I wake up in the morning and I feel maybe awake or energized. And I look down and go, yep, my HRV is pretty good and I got good night's sleep cool registered that what did i do last night hopefully i'll continue doing that or if the opposite happens and i'm a bit groggy and doesn't feel good i go oh actually didn't get much sleep wasn't great and my hrv's no good or heart heart rate's been a good one like heart rate yeah. resting heart rate's a big indicator of stress and fitness levels so it's she has just been game changing in that sense that's good to hear because i usually i i we had you know the whoop bands we yes. got given them to sleep and i'm I looked at it and then I realized that half the people were stressing out about kind of their whoop band score rather than just waking up and going, I feel all right, or waking up and going, I feel terrible. And then just not doing what they didn't do the night before. Yeah, that's what that's the that's the most important thing. I think if you wear it for just the sake of going, oh yeah, I feel like I've got had bad yeah. sleep, I'm no good, but not actually making any change, why are you yeah. wearing it? You've got to do it. It's got to be the, it should be there to improve your your lifestyle the the training or the, the the habits that you have that make you feel better you should be making yeah. action taking action to do that yeah yeah exactly um so look before we leave i always ask people a question of what they're potentially watching listening reading at the moment that's perhaps inspiring them that could be a recent documentary could be a film it could be a quote a book is there anything that's currently inspiring you at the moment that you're you're watching, reading, or listening to? Um, in all honesty, not particularly. I think um, I watched the boat story. That's brilliant. The, the um, what? But that's 
a boat story. It's about kind of these two people who found drugs on a boat. But it's not very okay. inspiring. It's just very interesting. <laughs> just educational. Um, yeah, exactly. I think for me, for, for me, I, I yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't really need to kind of read something or, or see something to 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 get myself going. I think I just you know getting back to playing right now is my my inspiration sort of thing. Love that. Love that. And from our conversation we've had, is there anything that you would challenge listeners to do and take action with for themselves? Being being as adaptable and, and changing for the positive as much as possible, I think being open to change, I think, is a big one. I think with the journey of self-discovery, um, kind of what we spoke about, finding genuine happiness, it all comes from being open to change and and being able to question things and then ultimately like like um you go on in there being able to to make those changes i think that's that's really important because that's when you you, you probably find that you you end up being like genuinely happy yeah that's good coming into the new years it's great advice Quick on that is there anything that you have are thinking about changing or doing differently now moving forward from both the injury point of view and, and looking after the body but maybe something the, the World Cup has taught you uh, or, and where you're at now. Is there anything that you are looking forward to getting back to and potentially changing and doing differently? Yeah, probably stretching. Interesting, right. <laughs> yeah, um, no, getting into good routines because it's not, mobility isn't just about stretching, it's kind of the activation, the foam rolling, it's the whole thing that encompasses it. I'm seeing the physio as much as possible, all that stuff. So make sure kind of like it is now with my food and my kind of supplements is that prescribed um so that's what i want to get to and then probably seeing the therapist more to be honest being proactive with stuff like that i think it's really important being just being a lot more proactive about things and rather than waiting for something to you know waiting for the wheels to fall off before you go see the mechanic mm-hmm. kind of just keeping on top of things really important that's something that i've mm-hmm. i started therapy uh maybe a couple of months maybe three months ago now like same thing same thing that i didn't feel anything was wrong or, yeah. well, I knew I wanted to do it. I, th- I knew I definitely wanted to do it. I just didn't actually find the right therapist that was, the, f- for me, was yeah. the right person to find. But I, I'm in such a better space just for, for purely talking about it. And it's for me being able to do the work that I do to make sure that I'm in a good place to help others rather than, yeah. than think that there's anything wrong with me right now. Have you, yeah. how long have you been doing it for? Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah. I think, I think the biggest thing though is like, everything could be going great i think talking about the great things and this is probably what my girlfriend told me as well it's like you you got to talk about when you're feeling good and great and then compared to when you're not feeling bad and kind of not so great and i think that's where the proactivity with everything comes about is like you just just constantly in touch with with everything i think that's really important that gives you a north star i find to get back to that space as long as you've registered where it's at registered where i feel good what it's like what am i doing what the habits what the ways i'm thinking talking being and then when it's not so great you've at least got a path back whereas if you don't register what you're doing well when you're when you're when you're in a good space you're kind of like well i don't actually know well how do i how do i get back to it yeah exactly because i think that it is important isn't it it's, it's, that's the garment yeah. you, you've got to you, you've got to register kind of what you're doing and then realize like what you've been doing so no it's important yeah hopefully more athletes now that they've they hear things like that and especially in the space of, of say rugby and and as even in my sport people adopting those sorts of conversations and doing it that would definitely inspire them from this conversation look tom thanks so much for your time mate i really appreciate it it's been really good to to get you on i'm so glad that we were able to carve out the time to do this No worries. Thank you very much for having me. It's it's been brilliant.